right, uh, welcome to Cassandra Lunch 59. Today's topic is functions in Cassandra. We'll be going over both default functions and user defined functions. Speaker will be me, Obi Oman Nachi. Uh, call me Obi if you would like to get in contact with me. Uh, my email is there on the screen now. The organizer and co-organizer of this event are Raul Singh, Arpan Patel, and Josh Barnes. I'm stepping in today um, to give the intro, um, but if you would like to be a co-organizer, you can get in contact with any of them. Um, and if you have ideas for sponsors, you can also get in contact with any of them or with me. Data Community DC is a diverse community of data practitioners. Um, we encourage participation from members of all protected classes, including race, gender, sexual orientation, etc. Data Community DC is also a community made up of a number of other communities of data practitioners, including uh, Full Stack DC, Data Wranglers DC, um, and Statistical Seminars. You can find information about their upcoming events um, at the sites listed there. During this lunch, what we cover is Cassandra and Cassandra related things, anything related to the Cassandra protocol. So including Cassandra, including data stacks, even including things like Cosmos DB backed by Cassandra, um, as well as things that connect to or work with Cassandra. Uh, so right now is time for any new um, participants, if they would like to, to unmute and introduce themselves, tell us who you are, what you do with data, what you want to get out of this uh, particular talk, um, and what you might want to see in the future um, from these talks. Okay, won't be forcing anyone today. So moving on to the group rules. If you have a question during the presentation, ask it. Um, presenters often have particular ways they would like you to ask questions during the presentation. Luckily, uh, today is my presentation and I prefer questions in the chat. Um, be polite and courteous to others and share what you know. This is a community. We would like to hear from you if you know more or if you have questions that need ask, answering or if you would just like to talk about data with people who know about data, feel free to speak up. Uh, we are a non-corporation work with Datastax. Um, we are partner with GW University. Um, they often give us event space um, if we are in need of it for in-person events. And we also have other program sponsors that can be seen here, as well as organizational sponsors that can be seen here. Now we have time for announcements. If anyone is looking for a job or hiring, um, has upcoming meetups, hackathons, conferences, or classes to announce, this is the time for that. All right. Well, one announcement is that Anant ourselves are hiring. Um, we are looking for full-time or part-time data platform operators, engineers, or architects. You can find out more by going to careers at anant.us. Uh, and our ongoing Cassandra events are our own workshops, uh, Cassandra Lunch and Data Engineers Lunch every Wednesday and Monday, respectively, at this time slot. Uh, data Stacks also has weekly workshops. Um, some of our upcoming topics for these lunches are uh, Cassandra and Apache NiFi, uh, Grafana dashboards and Cassandra, which will actually be given by a guest speaker sometime next month. And you can get a full accounting of our upcoming events by going to anant.us slash events. And all of the videos for these Cassandra lunches and data engineers lunches are posted on YouTube. And you can find more of our resources um, that we collect and uh, and collate at cassandra.link. Those are uh, hand selected and are basically the premier sort of um, knowledge base if you would like to learn more about Cassandra. All right. So moving on to today's topics or topic, I guess. Uh, we'll be talking about functions in Cassandra. 
the default functions available, default aggregations available, um, user-defined functions. We actually won't be talking too much about user-defined aggregations um, today, but it will certainly be a topic for a future Cassandra launch. Um, just as a reminder, I prefer questions in chat, um, and when we are at a stopping point in between, say, talking about default functions and uh, user-defined functions, or in between the end of the presentation and the start of the demo, um, there will be time for questions then, and I'll go over whatever's in the chat um, has been posted since the start. So, talking about first the Cassandra native functions. Um, so what functions do in Cassandra generally is that they transform one or more column values into a new value um, for each row. Um, and then aggregations can then take those values and, <coughs> and combine them so you get a singular value for whatever range you are selecting. Um, Cassandra native functions include blob conversion functions that work with the Cassandra blob type, which is just binary, um, a binary blob basically. Um, UUID and time UUID functions, the token function, write time functions, TTL functions. There are standard aggregations like min, max, sum, and average, and uh, token functions on there again for some reason. Got to fix that. Okay. So the Cassandra native functions. So first is the blob conversion functions. In Cassandra, the blob type stores raw binary data as a string of hex characters. And Cassandra comes with a couple of inbuilt functions to convert values between blob types and other Cassandra native types. Uh, so normally blob is used for storing small amounts of binary information like an image or a sound file. Um, which you would then have to translate back and forth to the actual, um, the actual format for, for display or use on, on a site. Um, but also you can convert any of the other CQL types to a blob or from a blob. Uh, so if you have a say big int type, you can say big int as blob and you'll get back a blog with a, a blob, sorry, with a value corresponding to that, to the value of that particular cell. Um, so you can do that for strings, you can do that for any of the native CQL types. Um, and then you can also get them back from blobs uh, or transform what is actually some sort of native blob if you are uploading an image or using a, a blob for some other like a, a pickled Python object or something like that. Um, as a blob, you can translate that to any of the actual Cassandra native functions, although I don't know exactly why you would want to. Um, and then UUID and time UUID functions. So the UUID generates a random UUID um, I believe you can also give it some sort of seed um, that will generate specific UUIDs. Um, and then the rest are all working for all for working with time UUID and timestamp uh, mm -hmm. types in Cassandra. So date of and Unix timestamp of work with time UUID, um, which is the same format of a UUID but the first half of it is actually a timestamp, a full timestamp. And then the rest ensures uniqueness. So you can get, you take your time UID and you use date of to extract the timestamp and then extract the date from that timestamp. Um, so you get back the date associated with the time UID, or you can use Unix timestamp of, and it will give you back a normal timestamp. Uh, or maybe seconds since the epoch, or not seconds, milliseconds, microseconds, um, since the Linux epoch, uh, and give you back the timestamp that is associated with that time UUID. You can also use min time UUID and max time UUID to generate a time UUID that is consistent with the date that you give it. Um, and then now does the same thing for the particular date time that it is right now. So it generates a time UUID, and if you were to extract the timestamp, it will be whatever time it was created. 
and then timestamp. Um, there are a number of functions in Cassandra for converting between timestamp, date, time, UUID types, um, and working with those, getting out the, say, day of a particular timestamp, or things like that. Um, or and then the token function, um, if you use it, you can get the token that Cassandra is using to sort your rows between nodes. Um, so it takes your, your primary key, transforms that into a token, and then uses that because each node has an assigned token range to give your data to the node that it's supposed to be on. Um, this is not super useful if you're using Cassandra's uh, default a partitioner, which will sort your data between nodes um, <laughs> in order, given your given your primary key. Uh, but if you're using, say, the random partitioner, knowing what token um, your <coughs> your row will end up with allows you to go and retrieve it, <coughs> even if it's out of sorted order. All right, other Cassandra native functions. The write time function returns the date and time that a particular column was written to the database. Um, so it is for each particular cell. So each row, each column has its own write time, I believe. Um, and then there's the TTL function, which will return the time to live or number of seconds before a particular cell is replaced with a tombstone, uh, which during compaction will mean it gets deleted. Um, and once a thing has been marked with a tombstone, uh, not once it has a TTL, but once it's actually been replaced with a tombstone, uh, your reads will no longer be able to retrieve that data. And then there are standard aggregate functions such as min, max, sum, average, and count, um, which to be pretty familiar, they do what it says on the tent. So moving on a little bit to user-defined functions. Uh, they allow the execution of user-provided code in Cassandra. By default, um, well, by default, Cassandra doesn't support user-defined functions at all um, because you have to enable it in Cassandra.yaml. Uh, but once you turn that on, you can use UDFs uh, defined in Java and defined in JavaScript. Um, and then once created, user-defined functions exist on the key space level as part of the Cassandra schema. Um, so if you define the key space, not only will all of your tables show up, as well as your user-defined types, but also user-defined functions. Um, and because of this, they get replicated to each node automatically, so there's no need to copy them between nodes or create them on each node individually. Um, it is possible to get other programming languages, um, get access to other programming languages, um, something like Python, um, but you need to add the jars for processing that to, to your Cassandra cluster. <coughs> uh, you can use user-defined functions and types, uh, user-defined types in your functions, as well as you can use collections and tuples, um, and obviously, all of the native Cassandra types can also be fed into functions. Um, and then your functions can be used as part of select, insert, and update statements. And then your functions are created using the create function statement, um, which can be used with or replace if you want to replace a function that already exists um, with a new one, or if not exists, if you want to only replace, uh, only add your function if that slot is empty and not replace one if it already exists. All right, so we're going to move on to the demo. There is a little bit of time for questions now. If you would like, just put them in chat. Uh, maybe it's an obvious question. You may have covered it. I was a little late, but um, that's a major difference between like a user-defined function and a user-defined aggregate. 
is that a function is acting on on a or should be acting on a row, whereas an aggregate can act on a partition? Yes. Um, so the way that um, aggregates work in Cassandra is they run a function on each of the rows as that are part of your selection, um, and then at the end combine them all together. So if you if you did like a multi-partition query, it would it would still work against all of the multiple parts. It's not limited to the partition, basically. Yes, uh, you can run your aggregate on sort of an arbitrary selection of data from your database, um, and your aggregation should still work properly. Okay, cool. Thanks. All right. Uh, is this actually visible? Let's see. increase the font size. Not terribly better. <laughs> Try doing like a control scroll up. Sometimes that works. Like uh, control and then your mouse wheel. No? Yeah. Oh, well. All right. Well, I mean, that's what I get for using uh, Docker for <laughs> Windows and uh, not being on Windows 10. <laughs> Okay, uh, so currently all that is running here. Oh wait, we are still inside the Docker container. So what we have running here is our, our simple two node cluster. Um, all I've done so far is replace the Cassandra YAML file um, and restart the cluster. Um, so if you look inside of the Cassandra.yaml, you can see that enable scripted user defined functions is set to true and enable user defined function. No, this one. Enable user defined functions is also set to true. Um, so enable user defined functions allows you to use Java and the other one enable scripted user defined functions allows you to use JavaScript um, in your functions. So what we want me to do, insert into one of our containers and open up SQL shell. So the first step uh, to creating your function, uh, well, I mean, technically there are ways around this, but you want to be in your key space. Um, so I'm just gonna go into our test key space and just to prove there is data We'll do a select count. We got 40, about 50,000 rows. It looks like two of them were formatted wrong or some otherwise uh, failed to get inserted properly. but we do indeed have data. Uh, so obviously count is an aggregate function. Um, I'm pretty sure what it does is it goes through and it assigns each of your each of your rows as one. And at the end, it combines them all together and sums them together. Um, and that's how you get your count. So first, where is my cursor? Let's look at what the data looks like. So this is all essentially just randomly generated nonsense. Um, but you can see there is a four column partition key. Primary key also includes two more columns, date and TS. And then there is a last column outside of that metric value. Um, so first thing we want to try is running one of the Cassandra native functions. I'm going to 
try date of. So you can see our time UID field. What we've done is we've gone in and we've used date of in order to grab the timestamp from that um, and display it as a row. Um, so when they said that you can also use them in inserts, they mean that you can take um, your data that's being inserted. Say you have a, a timestamp that or a time UID that you're inserting into your Cassandra table. You can use data of to also insert the date associated with that timestamp. So next, we are going to create a function. Since we're already in our key space, we can just say function. We're going to be using the uh, inbuilt Java math.sign um, in order to get the sign of some of our values. And then over parentheses, you describe your arguments. In this case, we're just going to call it input. It's a single value. Do you describe their type? And then the options that we want, we want returns no on no input we want returns double otherwise and we are going to define our language as java and then here is the part where we define our function this one's going to be relatively simple um, we're going to delimit them with a double dollar sign at, for now. And what we want to return is the double casted value of math.sign of our input value. So once we close our parentheses, we end our line with a semicolon. And then we end the code section uh, with our double dollar sign as well. And then we can end this line of CQL uh, with a semicolon. Did I spell that wrong? Let's see. Okay, now that we have our function, <coughs> our function created, we can use it the same as any other function. get our results. And then the last thing to show off is if you then look at the description for your key space, you see not only your table definition and your key space definition, but also your function definition, including the code itself. That is all I've got to show off for today. There is now more time for questions or if there are other data related topics, specifically Cassandra related, I guess is Cassandra launch um, that people would like to discuss. This is also the time for that.
Is there a large performance impact when using functions in Cassandra? I believe there is some impact, but I wouldn't say there's a, a large hit to performance when you're using functions. Right. If there are no other questions, uh, even though you use another language than native ones like Python, uh, I'm not actually sure. I know that to use Python in the first place, you're adding the jar file, um, but I don't know if that extra interaction uh, causes an extra hit to performance. Doing with experience using uh, using Python defined functions in Cassandra here. All right, something to look into. Uh, maybe I will include it in the blog for this Cassandra launch if I'm able to find a satisfying answer. have a link. I believe data stacks. I know this one discusses it. I don't know if it has a link to the jar itself or instructions on uh, on building that. Um, yeah, good 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 presentation. Um, did you e experiment with like JavaScript versus Java to see if it was like a big big difference? Uh, no, not really. I mostly stuck with Java. Gotcha. Yeah, um, there's a really good article that I've clipped on uh, Cassandra Link on kind of the performance of like, they're actually pretty fast. Um, if you do like a, a query, like like it's like with count, if you, if you do it on a partition and not like multi-partition, um, if you think about it, you know, what's happening in Cassandra when you pull data it puts stuff into a Java object yeah. and then it sends it to you. So if you make a function like count, it's it's iterating through a collection in Java, which we do all day in code, right? Um, or, 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 or an aggregation, basically, again, if you're doing anything inside a programming language and not inside like a database, we're used to for loops, right? So as long as your for loop doesn't go across partitions, it's actually pretty fast. And, and the reason is that a partition exists in its entirety in a machine. 
So when you do a select and then you do a function call on it, it's going to all happen on that machine. When you do a multi-partition query, if those partitions happen to be on different machines, then the coordinator has to like basically, and I, I have to double check to see if the calculation happens on the server where the data is before it gets to you, but I'm pretty sure it happens in the coordinator node. So you're basically putting a lot of undue stress on the coordinator node. But um, uh, I know that a few companies uh, have made their, like that, that I've worked with have made their own user defined functions. And it's basically for like simple statistical calculations that they need to do across data all day, every day. Um, and, you know, they don't want to pre-compute it all with Spark. Um, but because their partition sizes are manageable, you know, um, it's, it, it works basically. And they can display that information in, in basically real time. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a cool technology. I think people just don't understand when to not use it that's when they get into trouble yeah good 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 show really good show cool thanks does everybody wrap wrapped up we're good yeah uh i think the recording's still going but oh okay <laughs> sorry like so, i thought yeah. the recording and stop all right well no, it's uh, something we can put into the video then <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah, just edit it out, right? Edit it all, out all my BS. Um, awesome. Thanks.